Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Friday morning, October 25th of 2024. Welcome to Foundations as we get our morning started this Friday. I'm very thankful for your presence here today. Um, wow, my my camera is kind of acting up here. Hang on just a second. That was interesting. There we go, huh? Something hit my camera and knocked it off the, the kilter there. So, hey, uh, looking forward to spending time with you here this morning. Welcome to Foundations. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for being here this morning. Thanks for the weekly opportunity to spend together to do as iron sharpens iron as we walk our faith each and every day and as we encourage each other to walk in faith. So um, <clears throat> your world and my world have come together this morning for a reason, I believe. And both of us are better people because of our time together. Um, I, I think I've said it, might have even said it this morning and forgot already, but um, I live by that as iron sharpens iron, so does one man sharpen another. I think that as uh, I go through life, um, I am a better person because of the people I am able to be around. There are people I agree with as well as those I disagree with that I'm around, and both can teach me about how my life needs to be um, and how I may, need to make my choices. So, all right. So, welcome to the 25th day of October 2024, as I said before. Um, let's jump right in. Here's the question for this morning. Um, you may or may not have your favorite uh, idea here. There may be some conflicting thoughts. You may not have a specific. Um, mine is going to be a little odd, but those of you who know me know that's just my way. I'm a little odd on occasion. So here's the question this morning. What is your favorite pie and do you eat it with ice cream? What is your favorite pie and do you eat it with ice cream? Now, mine's not a pie. I like um, basically blackberry cobbler. Um, uh, it's really a pie of sorts, but it's a cobbler. And if I was a smart person, I'd know what the difference is. But I know this. I really love blackberry uh, cobbler and ice cream. Always eat ice cream with it if at all possible. So um, comment down below. Let me know what is your favorite pie and do you eat ice cream with it? Okay. So I hope this morning finds you doing well. Uh, we've had some issues around here at our place. Um, Teresa has been sick, so pray for her as she is recuperating. She hopefully be back to work today. Um, I continue to have multiple health issues. Um, breathing issues specifically was this past week and um, just a number of things. And it seems like that uh, about the time I feel like I'm feeling a lot better, I end up feeling a little less. So if you would just pray for us around here, um, got some other folks, a couple of volunteers have had surgery. And so it's just been a real kind of uh, kind of push, 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 push kind of time. In addition to that, we have our banquet coming up next Tuesday. Just pray for everything going on with all of that. We really could use your help um, in prayer for that. So, <clears throat> so we're looking at our new ser or the series called Double Trouble. And this is our third week in this series. <clears throat> so today we're going to jump back into Luke 15, very uh, familiar passage. And we're going to take a look at a different portion of the story than oftentimes many people who read the story actually cover. And so today is going to be something just a little bit beyond maybe what you've ever looked at with the uh, prodigal son story. It may be something you're going to say, well, I know exactly. And you may have heard this a thousand times. But let me tell you this. This particular part of the story is the most um, pointed um, teaching in this particular uh, parable. And you'll see why when I'm done, because it's not just about someone coming back home and all their sins being forgiven. It's not just about a father who loves, but this is about the attitude of those who are watching from the sidelines sometimes and who do not know what is best and think they do. That we want to be kind of our own savior to some degree. And so we're going to talk about that this morning. So remember the chapter in chapter 15 of Luke, we talked about some parables. There's basically some lost parables, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. And last week we took a look at the audacity of the younger brother that he asked his father for his inheritance early, basically said, Father, I want you dead and I want my money. And then he went out and he wasted each and every dollar he could and just absolutely wasted what his father had given him and uh, was not even close to thankful, but unfortunately was very disrespectful. 
But the most surprising part of last week was this, that in spite of the boy's actions, in spite of the boy's choices, in spite of all the things that he did, the father totally and absolutely forgave him. Not only did he forgive him, <clears throat> but probably one of the most amazing phrases in all of Scripture, <clears throat> and that is this. The father saw him a long way off, and he ran and threw his arms around his neck. You see, the father was waiting for the younger son to come home. It was absolutely his heart that that younger son, even though the younger son had done so much wrong and had been so disrespectful, the father could not wait for him to be home. So that's what was really cool about this uh, about this uh, son's return. So now let's go back to Luke chapter 15. I want to pick up there at verse 25. I'm going to read the passage for you. Now his older son was in the field. As he came and drew near the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these, what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. Talking about the older brother now. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you and never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. You see, it was a fatted calf, so that was a big deal. Meat wasn't eaten at the meals, but not only did he just do a, not only did the father do a, a meal for the, the younger brother coming home, but he did the fatted calf. He did the biggest celebration meal he could do, and it was a big deal in the father's life, the big deal in the father's world. And the, the older brother now says, you didn't even give me a young goat. You know, something of less value. You haven't even done that for me and my friends. He goes on, verse 30. But when this son of yours came, he, uh, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. <clears throat> and he said to him, son, the father, the father says, son, you are always with me. And all that is mine is yours, which was true. Because once the estate had been separated into two-thirds for the older brother, one-third for the younger brother, basically everything that was left after the younger brother had uh, gone away from home, everything that was left belonged to the older brother. And the father is saying to him, basically everything I have is yours. And then he says, it was fitting to celebrate and be glad for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. And so here we have it. The older brother is now returning. He finds out there's a party and he is a much different picture than what we saw with the situation last week. The younger son did not put up any resistance. He took his father's love and he allowed the father to throw this, the party for him. And um, we see a much different picture here today. As a matter of fact, this elder brother, he is not happy about this feast. He is absolutely irritated. As a matter of fact, he's angry. And not only is he angry, but he's also standoffish. He won't even go into the party. He won't even do what the father's asking him to do. The father says, come on, let's celebrate. And he says, I'm not doing it. The father even, come, even comes out and pleads with him. And this is so critical. This is so critical for you and I to understand. There are situations where you and I do not like the way God has done something. And maybe we think God should have done it some other way. Maybe we think God should give us something that we didn't get, or we prayed for something and we didn't get it. If we're not careful, we're going to have this attitude that this young, that this older brother had. He is going to be, or we're going to be in a position like he is, where we believe that no matter what God has said or pleaded us to have, we want to do the things we want to do. You see, what happens is this. We want to attribute our goodness our savedness, our stand with the Savior, we want to base it on what we have done, not what Jesus has done. And as a result of that, oftentimes, we have a tendency to become like the Pharisees and become very puffed up and think that we, through our behavior, have been able to keep our salvation or gain our salvation. We believe because we were good people, we grew up in church, who knows? But as a result, we get into this mindset that says, God, I've been good, now you need to do this, or you even owe me something. 
And when we attribute our salvation, our home in heaven, or even our spiritual maturity to what we have done, we have become our own savior. In other words, we believe our actions, we believe our attitudes, we believe what we've done is actually what has saved us. Now that's scary. We know very, very pointedly that we cannot save ourselves. Matter of fact, we know that it's by grace we are saved through faith and that not of ourselves according to what has been written in Ephesians. But here's what's interesting. When we get involved in the things that we call religion, when we get involved in the things sometimes we even call Christianity, our prayers, the way we do our praise, our hands raised, the type of music we listen to, the way in which we do, the type of Bible we read, how often we read our Bible, how we have our devotions, how we're committed, how we're witnessing, whatever, our behavior now becomes the standard that we decide to measure ourselves by, not the grace that we've been given. And the fact that anything you've ever done right is not because you are right. It's because you've been made right through Jesus Christ. And we get this puffed up arrogance that because we go to church regular, because we do things regular, we do not see ourselves as capable of what this elder brother did. And this is what's even more telling and it's actually the opposite of the younger brother, but the same expectation. The younger brother wanted the father's things, but didn't want the father. He wanted the father's things to go off and to enjoy what he wanted for prestige and for all of that. He wanted to build a party and have a good time. That's what the younger brother wanted to do. But the older brother wanted the father's things, but he didn't want the father's heart. See, the father's heart was to reconcile the younger son back to him. The father's heart was to have the whole family together and to throw a celebration. The father's heart was to say, wow, it's great that everybody's back together and we can worship and have a great time together. We can celebrate and we can have a meal together. We can absolutely um, basically go out and have a great time together. And why wouldn't we? We're all together. And yet the older brother, he will not come in. He does not want anything to do with this. He wants the father's things, but he doesn't want the father, nor does he want the father's heart. You see, you and I need to understand it's not just enough for us to repent of the sins that we have done. We must also learn to repent of the reasons why we think we've ever done anything right. You see, you think you're the one that chose to do right. You think that you're the one who is basically keeping your salvation. You think you're the one that through your behavior, through your practices, through your worship, through whatever that you do that's religious and Christian, you believe that through those things you're actually being able to sustain your salvation, and you're not. You're not capable of sustaining salvation. You're not capable of giving salvation. You're not capable of obt obtaining salvation on your own. You are kept through the uh, through the sacrifice and the shed blood of Jesus Christ in faith in that matter by his grace. And when you begin to think what you do and how you act and how you speak and how much you witness and what kind of Bible you read and all those things, and this, a lot of those things are important, don't get me wrong, but in the wrong place, they cause you to have the wrong attitude. And unfortunately, because of that wrong attitude, you have this older brother attitude, which is oftentimes, why would God forgive someone like that? A pastor falls because he does something that is wrong. And because he repents and comes back, someone says basically, oh, he should never do this. He should never do that again. Or a, a, a religious leader or a Christian leader, a female Christian leader gets in, involved in something she shouldn't get involved in. And she repents and she comes back and she's serving within the body of Christ again. And someone says, well, they shouldn't be allowed to do that. So who are you? Are you the Savior? Are you the one who gets to determine the younger brother's fate? Because that's what the older brother wanted to do. He wanted to determine the younger brother's fate. And sometimes you feel like you can determine the other person's fate because of the sin they have done. And that sin, as far as you're concerned, has crossed the line. And because it's crossed the line, they should not be given anything. Matter of fact, they should just be thankful they're in the, in the family at all, in the body of Christ. 
I mean, after all, they've been forgiven. They should be thankful for that. In other words, they shouldn't have dreams or aspirations as how God could use their life from that day forward because you've already passed judgment on that. And as a result, you have an elder brother attitude. You see, when you do that, you become your own savior. And you honestly believe you are the one who keeps you right. You are the one who keeps your heart clean. And you are the one who keeps you in the step of the whole in step with the Holy Spirit because of your behavior, not because of the power of Christ or the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you. You see, the gospel of Jesus Christ is neither morality nor immorality. It is not anything in between those two. The gospel of Jesus Christ is that because we are sinners, we need a savior. And because he died for us and gave his life for us, Jesus is willing to become our savior. The perfect taking on sin so that the imperfect could take on perfection. God doesn't want good people. Listen to me. God is not looking for good people. He's not roaming around saying, hey, where's the good folks at? I want them in my body. He's walking around seeing sinners. He doesn't want good people. He wants new people. That's what he wants. He wants new people. You see, the audience now would have seen themselves in the story. The sinners and the tax collectors would have saw themselves as the younger brother. And now the scribes and Pharisees are seeing themselves as the older brother. And neither one are comfortable with what they see. Neither one are happy with what Jesus is saying. He is exposing them for what their heart is. They want the Father's things, but they do not want the Father. They want God's stuff, but they don't want God. And now Jesus has exposed them through this story. And now you and I also need to see ourselves through this story. We need to see ourselves in this story. You see, the most amazing thing is this, is that you and I need to see that we cannot, in our arrogance, be good Christians. We must have the power of Christ. We live through the work of the Holy Spirit, and we operate through the work of the Holy Spirit, and that is the only way you and I live life like Christ. In closing this morning, let me just say this, or let me ask this, I mean. Have you ever been jealous or angry because of what God has done for someone else? Maybe they have a new car, a new house, a new life. Maybe they have a better job than you do. Maybe they've had better things than you have. Or maybe they've done something really horrible like I talked about, and they were a Christian, should have known better, but they've come back and they've repented, and now you think God should do something, whatever that is? Because they should pay? Well, what you believe is, is they can pay to forgive for their sins, and they can't. What you believe in all honesty is that you've paid to make yourself good, and you can't. When it comes down to brass tacks, you feel like you can say to God, I've been faithful or I've been good. I certainly haven't done what so-and-so has done. I've never killed anybody. I've never had an affair. I've never wanted to, you know, and whatever you think is your list of moral rights and wrongs. If we're not careful, we can find ourselves wanting the Father's things, but not the Father. Wanting his blessings, but not him. And if he doesn't do things our way, the way we perceive they should be done, if we're not careful, we can find ourselves angry and upset and out of walk and out of step with the Savior, out of fellowship with the Father and his choice for our path in life. I want to close in prayer today. I think it's critical that every so often that we just pray together. And so this morning I want to pray together. So I'm going to ask if you would to join me in this prayer this morning. Jesus, I want you. I am human, so I know I want many other things as well. But I ask you for your mercy on my life this morning. I ask you for your mercy on my attitude this morning. I ask you to forgive me of the attitudes and the actions and the arrogance that I have experienced and exhibited sometimes. Lord, forgive me from the, for those and help me as I continue to learn to follow you. Give me wisdom and grace for each challenge I am facing, each time I want to become judgmental. Help me to guard my heart against condescending attitudes. Help me to guard my heart and my attitudes 
against wanting your stuff and not wanting you. Please help me to love like you love, to forgive like you forgive, to want what you want, not just the blessings, but to want you in the highs and the lows in my walk in faith and my walk through life. And I want to thank you for how you will do that. And I praise you in your name this morning. And amen. Hey, thanks for joining me this morning. I really appreciate it. I hope you have uh, had an opportunity to reflect. I know I really enjoy, this is actually my favorite passage of scripture, is Luke 15. I enjoy the prodigal son story. There's so many angles to this story that um, um, that are, are just great for me to reflect upon for my own life. And I love teaching it because others seem to, uh, to uh, grow through its um, truths as well. So, so thanks for tuning in. Thanks for this morning. Before we leave out of here, let's get the question again. Question for this morning is, what is your favorite pie? And do you eat it with ice cream? Mine is blackberry cobbler. I, like I say, it's not a pie per se, but it is. Kind of same ingredients, different layout. But yes, absolutely hot with coal or with a, a big dip of vanilla ice cream. Boy, is that good. All right. Thanks for tuning in this morning. Really appreciate you. See you next week as we finish up the series Double Trouble. You won't want to miss it, okay? Till next week, you have a fabulous Friday. Have an amazing and wonderful weekend. Until next Friday morning, as I say, each week as we do. Bye-bye. Now.